Good evening, everybody. We're going to get started very shortly here. Um, I'll do my, uh, my intro uh, that I've been doing for board members. Your microphones are turned off when you're ready to speak. Please make sure you turn them on, bring them close to your mouth. It helps with the uh, sound and audio for um, those that are participating uh, remotely. Mr. Martinez, uh, if you want to take us out of the um, practice session, and uh, we'll just wait a few minutes. Uh, we're almost at 7 o'clock to see a few people log in and uh, then we'll get started. Uh, just another few seconds. Education is open to members of the public to be physically present. Members of the public that attend will be asked to follow the same procedures as all other visitors to our schools. Those procedures can be found on the agenda page of our website. Additionally, the board meeting will be live streamed for viewing purposes only. Anyone wishing to view the meeting may do so via Zoom. The webinar ID for this meeting is 886 1323 and the required password is 075165. I'd like to call this meeting to order at 701. Mr. Baker, please call the roll. Dr. Park. Here. Ms. Sacone. Here. Mr. Copeland. Here. Ms. Devanero. Here. Mr. De Silva. Here. Mr. Denise. Here. Mr. Gallo. Here. Mr. Kismarski. Here. Dr. Morthy is absent this evening. Mr. Silva. Adequate notice of agenda of this meeting has been provided to the Ridgewood News and the record specifying that the Mawa Board of Education will meet on May 4th, 2022 in the administrative offices, 60 Ridge Road, Mawa, New Jersey. A copy was filed at the Township Clerk. <coughs> Ladies and gentlemen, please rise, face the flag of our nation, place your right hand over your heart, and repeat after me. I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation, under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. all right, we're going to move executive session to the end of the meeting tonight. Uh, so agenda questions. Please limit your questions at this time to res uh, resolutions under new business on this agenda. As a matter of fairness, you're asked to limit your questions to no more than one and your remarks to no longer than three minutes. If you're here representing a group, please identify yourself, the group, and your position in the group. If you're here as an individual, please give us your name and address. This section of public participation will be limited to 15 minutes. Please specify the resolution you are referring to in your question. I have a motion to open. Mr. Kismorski, second by Mr. Gallo. We are open to the public at 703. Good evening, Earl. I'm asking a question about. Your name and address, please. Oh, sorry, Lou Theodoro. My apologies. Uh, one hour now, please. Um, it's agenda item number M, specifically leading school at SEL from Castle. Um, so Dr. Dottoro and I have uh, had a conversation about this before. I had a nice conversation with um, um, Dr. Bino as well. I've spoken with uh, Mr. Corey and with Ms. Pop my wife spoke with Ms. Paul Castro about our concerns about the SEL curriculum. About four weeks ago, my daughter saw a, um, it was a quick video at the beginning of uh, math class about perspective taking, but the last 30 seconds of the video um, touched on social justice and had a bunch of emblems which were all left lean. Um, and my daughter came home upset um, and wanted to know what, what, what that was, what the, why they were learning about that in math class. 
had a good conversation with the, the teacher about it, um, referred us to, to Ms. Palcastro. My wife had a conversation with Palcastro. I wasn't privy to that, but she had a good conversation. Um, she said we, we have one more information to talk to Mr. Corey. At that point, we wanted to see more of the SEL curriculum and what was going into uh, the SEL curriculum. Mr. Corey was fantastic. He, he, he showed us a bunch of videos. I gather the district pulls up from a lot of different resources, um, Castle being one of them, which is why I'm bringing it up here. Um, lessons, um, kind of a kind of a, a database where they can pull um, ideas and lessons from that they're kind of, I guess, approved by team leaders. Um, and, but was unable to show us that without us going into his office and um, um, seeing it. But he was very kind to let us do that. Um, and then he referred us on to some um, uh, resource that we could use, Castle being one of them. Castle apparently is a big SEL, I guess you guys would know, but it's a big SEL um, vendor. Um, not the vendor you use directly, according to Mrs. or to, according to Dr. Vivino, you know, mindful something. Um, but it's, it's it, you do pull resource from. So in doing research with Castle, I went to their website and immediately, their, their website is pretty provocative. Oh, their, their thing is they want to transform SEL and they define transform SEL as a process whereby young people and adults build strong, respectful, and lasting relationships that facilitate co-learning to critically examine the root cause of inequality and develop collaborative solutions and that leads to personal community and societal well-being. It's all fine. But this form of SEL is aimed at redistributing power to more, to more fully engage young people and adults in working toward just and equitable schools and communities. And the redistributing power, I mean, that's a, that's a needlessly provocative kind of buzzword, um, especially in today's society. And you guys are going to go through this with the, uh, the sex ed curriculum. Um, to me, I mean, they're telling you what they're doing. Um, I will give them that. They're not trying to hide it. I mean, the big big concern with a lot of parents is that the SEL cur um, curriculum becomes an area where kids can become indoctrinated into certain ideas. Um, certainly, um, they're exposed to those, and that's okay, but it's not, in my uh, um, concern, is it's not being, you, they're not getting both sides of the coin. Um, that video only shows, for example, left-leaning um, um, emblems. So my question is, how, why do we use Castle? Um, how hard is it to not use Castle? And how hard it would be would it be for us to have a database so the parents could see the lessons that kids are seeing in school? I talked about it with Mr. Corey. He made it sound like it was impossible that, that um, teachers will pull something from somewhere, you know, the night before. Um, and I understand that's good teaching, especially if you're trying to be topical in a topical kind of class. Math may not be that that way, but um, how is it possible for us to for and. and for the parents to see what the kids are seeing. Because my daughter was able to fill up the video on YouTube within four seconds, much better than I would be. Um, and I'm, I'm wondering how easy would it be to have a central database and and to to not use a vendor that's so, I mean, they're telling you what they're doing, but to, that is using that kind of uh, verbiage. Mm -hmm. Um, so let me start with, with Castle as a whole. Um, along the lines of the provocative nature, when one looks at Castle's website, there's, there's five uh, key elements of what SEL is. So I, I don't want to jump over to the statement that you're referring to. Let's start from the beginning. When you talk about SEL, there's five key component, components. Self-management, self-awareness, responsible decision-making, relationship, relationship skills, and social awareness, which means showing understanding and empathy for others. So when you look at all of those specific criteria, in my mind, I feel like it's right for all of our kids to really understand and manage all of those things as they're starting to navigate the social terrain. Agreed. Um, along the lines of Castle, yes, Castle is a warehouse of a number of different resources that people are able to choose from. Mindful Practices is our primary vendor that's been able to come in and provide uh, PD specific to um, a large number of teachers and parents throughout our, our, dis our district because we know that, and uh, many people have come up here and shared that, um, especially over the past two years, it's been extremely stressful for our students and staff and to provide them with the tools that they need to navigate those situations are imperative. So um, giving them those five key competencies, I think is extremely important. Um, as it pertains to a, a warehouse or a group or an area to find um, to have people have access to those resources. It, it is a, a truly um, impossible task to do because as you look at our curriculum for math, 
Um, yes, we use everyday math at the elementary level. We use big ideas at the middle school level. But all of the resources that are used, we don't have them housed in a certain place. The supplemental resources right. that are used. Castle is a supplemental resource. It's not a primary resource. Mm -hmm. um, so that is a, extremely difficult. I'm extremely happy that uh, Ms. Paula Castro, Miss um, Polway, Mr. Corey, Dr. Ravino was able to, you were able to sit down and, and provide those, those uh understandings to you so are we yeah um so so i think that's extremely important that that we have those opportunities to sit down and just talk about really where 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 we're going along the lines of the the video that you're referring to the video you're referring to which i saw was about um perspective right and the reason why it was done in the in the math middle school classroom is because we're really trying to create opportunities for our math students to work collaborative, collaboratively with each other and understand how to um, effectively work in groups and know that there are different people in different groups that have different perspectives. Let's just talk math content-wise. Um, and to be able to respectfully hear and, and navigate those conversations are a key element of being a, a, a functioning member of society. So um, yeah, but I don't along the lines of the political up. side of it, I, I don't... Uh, that that's that's not a, a focus of what was discussed in the the math classroom. Um, but what I can tell you is the five key competencies of self management, self awareness, responsible decision making, relationship skills, and social awareness. I think is 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 truly important for our kids to do. And Castle um, understanding that there's a large um, bank of resources. I think it's important for us to utilize what resources we can. Um, and, and, and give the kids the skills they need to navigate. Okay, thank you. Hi, Stability Wardo, 5 Hampshire Road. I also have the same uh, question on agenda item N. The question I have is, I also have issues regarding the um, curriculum. So the big question I have is if you look at the state statutes, and again, um, Dr. DeToro, I'd like if you, uh, uh, from what I understand, the board sets policy the question I have is, the school curriculum is, according to your state statutes, this is New Jersey law, school curriculum is a matter of public record and must be released upon parent request. Uh, and this is from your New Jersey and state and federal statutes. New Jersey, and must be released upon parent's request. A parent could be charged, and they go into that. Again, if you look at the state and federal statute, again, you have the right, right to request a copy of your child's school curriculum. This is regarding social-emotional learning. What they did was they put social-emotional learning into the curriculum. So I actually had some issues with my son who has special needs. I, I would like to know. So I, he had an assignment due and was doing a assignment in social studies. And the social studies assignment, I was clicking into his Google Classroom and the assignment, they were using an app called Alelo. So again, Dr. Tora, I'm not, I would like for you to not answer this question, but this is for the board. In discussing this with the New Jersey Department of Education, I would like to know, in clicking on the app, app in my son's Google Classroom, the app is being used, which is Alelo. The questions that were asked were, not in relation to a social studies assignment, they were under social emotional learning, and they were asking him questions regarding his opinions regarding wealthy people taking care of people that don't have. Several questions about that, but the Alelo app that was being used, three children signed into computers in the classroom, and the Alelo app for the school says, Alelo is a pacing assisted app where students are paced and they are measuring the students' voice intonation, their verbal cues. So in other words, they're gonna tell somebody that's speaking too loudly to slow down, 
somebody that's talking too fast to slow their pace, somebody that's talking not fast enough. Basically, they're monitoring kids and how they're speaking. It has nothing to do with public speaking. Basically, it's a robot initiative. And what I'd like to know is in what sane society would an app like this be used? And then when I inquired to the school, I went to the school, because my son has special needs. I need, I need to know, I was trying to catch him up on his work. This was an accident that I stumbled upon this. The school basically said to me, I'm ending this conversation and refused to answer the question about this app, which because they didn't, wouldn't answer this question about the curriculum, landed me on the New Jersey website, which left me digging and digging back into the social emotional learning, which landed me to speak to the Department of Education, which landed me on the social emotional, the papers are endless. So my question is, how could it at all be impossible to get our kids' curriculum and even have refused to give us curriculum when then it says in the New Jersey Department of Ed, one more thing, you have the federally protected right to review teacher lesson plans, examine textbooks, and other supplemental materials like videos, activities, games, and curriculum, and individual daily lesson plans. So the thing is, I wouldn't be on this fishing expedition if somebody would have just told me. This took a couple of weeks. OK, so, so, was, so what you're saying is you asked the question, and somebody at school And I was outright it. told, my husband and I both. Uh -huh. and, and, and this started out innocent, like, hey, I'm trying to catch my son up. My son had an issue which I'm going to speak to at the public portion. I'm, I'm he had school refusal. I'm, I'm in his Google Classroom trying, trying to catch to him up, and this is what he evolved to. Trying to narrow it down a little bit. So, so you called the school, asked the question. I said, what is this? I'm, they, excuse, I'm in the, excuse, can I have the I'm curriculum? Sorry. So you called the school, you asked the question, and somebody said, we're not going to answer that question, and ended the conversation. And I quote. OK, yes. so in and that I don't, case, I'm in not that case I will tell you after the meeting, maybe, you know, Get That's with, why get, I asked Dr. Turturro to please not get involved, okay, because so, here's the thing, I went okay, to Dr. Turturro, Dr. Turturro, and Dr. and he did the right thing. So he's the guy who would be involved. Dr. So, Turturro so told the school to get back to me, and they're still refusing okay. the curriculum. So then, so then Dr. Turturro is exactly the guy that needs to get involved after the meeting. Correct, but Thank the you. school Thank is you. still leading me on goose chases. Thank they're you. not giving curriculum. So my question to you is, the board is responsible for curriculum posting on the websites and for the parents. Not, not, not the school. You set policy to ensure the laws are met, and right. that's, that's what correct. the Board of Ed told that's me correct. today. And, and if you're telling me that the law is not met, then I, I'm telling you after this meeting, let's have a conversation with Dr. Detroit okay, more thank efficient. you. Thank, thank you very much. No, 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 no. Uh, Good evening, Robert Ferguson, 23 Upper Terrace. I'm just going to talk to uh, issue 17A, the annual budget. I'm uh, just going to follow up with you guys. I know uh, Council President May spoke last uh, uh, last meeting about forming some, uh, getting together and having a meeting to talk about ways we can co cooperate. Um, we'd also like to see what the status of that was. Um, we, uh, we, we took a look at some of the things that we could work on together, including paving. Um, we did take a look at the current job spec that was spec out for us, uh, for you guys, for the school board, for the high school. Uh, just based on our back of the envelope estimates, working together, we could have saved almost $200,000 on that project. Um, there's a lot of synergies we can do together. So the sooner we can start having these conversations, the better, um, because we do want to work together and want to find a way to work together for both the taxpayers and for you guys. That's it. Thank you. Thanks, Rob. And I know that there are, uh, we do have a, a, not a bad hoc committee, but Mike and, uh, and, and John are putting together some information to, uh, to meet with you guys very Thank shortly. You. Yep. Anyone else? We have a motion to close. Mr. Kuzmarski, second by Mr. Topper. Uh, superintendent's report, Dr. Dutero. What do you got for us? I have uh, some great news. Uh, let, I'll start with Rampo Ridge. Um, the Rampo Ridge Students and Administration invited me to meet 
with some student representatives because they're preparing for our incoming uh, sixth graders, their student orientation. The parents are coming, as well as the students. The students will be walked around. Uh, show, they'll be able to see the school, understand the different programs. Um, and these student representatives, which were a part of the sixth through eighth grade, um, wanted to put together really a recipe for our students to be successful. They looked at all the different opportunities and how they navigate schools, whether it's to be organized or responsible decision making or academically sound or creating those social connections with the students. So they were able to create really a, a cheat sheet of how to be successful um, at, the, at the middle school. So that's gonna be shared with our parents as well as our students. And I really appreciated the student voice uh, that came out during that meeting. The kids were excited to act as a, as a support for the, the new students. They remember how they felt walking into a new school. And I appreciate administration and, and the students' feedback on that. So it was definitely a bright spot last week. Um, so we have a couple more bright spots. Uh, Mawa High School was selected for the 2022 Best High School Silver Award by US News and World Report. What is a silver award, you may ask? U.S. Uh, News and World Report 2020 Best High Schools ranks schools based on student-teacher ratio, college readiness, advanced placement index, proficiency in math, as well as proficiency in ELA. Uh, there are three categories. There's gold, which is the top 500, silver, and bronze. Uh, as I said, we are silver. Mawa was ranked 43 um, in New Jersey out of 424 schools. Last year, we were 46, so we're going in the right direction. Uh, we were... 1,088 out of high schools nationally. Last year, we were 1,095, yet again, going in the right direction. And those rankings are out of 24,000 public high schools in the country. So we're in a really good space. How do we do against our Bergen County schools? Well, out of over 50 schools, we are ranked 10th um, in Bergen County. Uh, so that's really a testament uh, to not only our teachers at the high school, which are doing a great job, but John Pascal always says that um, he's, he greatly appreciates our K-5 teachers of really building strong foundations uh, that they can build upon once they get to the high school. High school. So it's a, a great opportunity for us to celebrate the great work that's happening here at Mawa. Another uh, big accomplishment for one of our students at the high school. Um, this was a headline uh, just this morning. Uh, 12 Bergen County High School students have won corporate sponsored National Merit Scholarship Awards. The first group of winners were announced to be a finalist. The semifinalist and the high school official must submit a detailed scholarship application according to the National Merit Scholarship Committee. The application must include information about the semifinalist's academic record, participation in school and community activities, demonstrated leadership abilities, employment, and honors and awards received. The semifinalist must have an outstanding academic record throughout high school, be endorsed and recommended by a high school official, write an essay, earn SAT and ACT scores that confirm that the student's early performance on the qualifying test. I'm happy to report one of those award winners is Ashita Jane of Mawa, who is, uh, her probable career will be in the field of medicine. Jane won the National Merit Siemens Scholarship to it and attends Mawa High School. So congratulations on that prestigious honor. Last but not least, this came in yesterday, our very own Coach Remo uh, recorded his 500th win as a coach here in Mawa with a 12-1 win over Ridgefield Park for boys baseball. The breakdown of those 500 wins, I know you were gonna ask. In football, 121 wins. In softball, 118 wins. And in baseball, 261 wins. So congratulations not only to Coach Remo, but all the athletes in which we've served over the years. So that's all I have. That's it. That's it. Mr. Bleeker, what do you got? Okay, I have uh, two reports this evening. Um, just bring this up. Uh, thank you, Mr. Galli. Yes, great. <coughs> So, two reports this evening. Um, first is our uh, budget presentation. Um, as I've said at the last two meetings, tonight is our last meeting discussing the uh, budget for the 22-23 year. This is the... 
Um, tonight's our budget hearing. Uh, this is an um, annual presentation that is made. This is the last, uh, one of the last pieces for uh, adopting and initiating the 22-23 budget. Uh, so I'm going to review a couple slides. The slides are going to be repetitive from uh, what I presented over the last couple of meetings regarding the 22-23 budget. Uh, one piece of new information, which I'll point out when I get to it. Um, First is a recap of the revenue for the 22-23 year. The first and most uh, significant part of revenue is our tax levy. Tax levy is just over $68,737,000. This represents a 1.43% increase from last year. This is the tax levy that is assessed to uh, taxpayers of the district for both our operating account as well as our debt service account. We have state aid of a little bit over $4 million, representing almost a 14% increase from last year. Uh, other miscellaneous revenue of about $227,000. A fund balance, which is uh, revenue that we use from other budgets to help fund the 22-23 budget. Again, for both our debt service account as well as our operating account. Uh, our special revenue account, where we have federal and state aids of just under $700,000. And then we have a revenue from our capital reserve account uh, to fund two potential capital projects, both our HVAC renovation projects, one at Bessie Ross Elementary School and one at George Washington Elementary School, uh, for a grand total budget for the 22-23 year of $79,302,771. For the tax impact, there are two major drivers, and this is the one change that I said has uh, has differed from the original presentation that I made. Um, the debt service has stayed the same. Debt service is decreasing $353,000 from last year. The debt service, again, is the taxpayer's obligation on bonded interest payments that have previously been approved. The other is an increase from the operating budget tax levy of 2% from the prior year. So we have an increase of 2% from the prior year. It's $1,325,917. Originally, when I presented to the board on March 25th, I had shared that at that time there was a part of uh, that calculation that represented um, Public Law 2020, Chapter 44, which was new at that time, was brand new for this year. I said at that time that that was being challenged. The calculation used to uh, arrive at, the, at that time was a deduction of $207,000. Ultimately, since then, over 100 districts in the state appealed to the um, to the state regarding that calculation, and ultimately it was uh, returned to us, so that full $207,000 was returned to us, which brings us to our uh, full tax, um, uh, maximum tax ability from one year for, to the next of 2%. To put that tax impact into numbers, again, pulling this from uh, our slide or at an earlier presentation, we have a net valuation taxable for the township of Mawa, of five billion seven hundred eighty-six million dollars. That's an increase of about eleven and a half million dollars from the prior year. And this is the base that our tax levy would be spread across. Uh, the average value of a home for the 2022 calendar year is four hundred seventy-eight thousand one seventy-nine, an increase of eight hundred sixty-six dollars from the prior year. And for the tax impact, for every one hundred thousand dollars of value that a home in Mawa has, one thousand one hundred and seventy-nine dollars of that is helps to fund the budget for the 22-23 year. It's an increase of $18.60 from the prior year. Uh, for the average value of a home that I mentioned earlier, $478,000, that equates to $5,640 is the tax impact, an increase of $88.94 from last year, from the calendar year 2021. We also spoke during the budget presentations about enrollment. February 2022 enrollment for the township, uh, for the district, was 2,735 students. These are students that are here within our six schools in Mawa, uh, representing both general ed and special ed. We have out of district students that attend placements outside of Mawa, uh, 62 special ed, and then 44 county or Votech students. Our debt service, I mentioned it a little while ago, but we have two bonds that are currently outstanding in 22-23. Payments on the principal for those bonds is $1,075,000. 
as well as payment of 44883 And one of those bonds, we are going to be making the final payment next year in the 22-23 year. And for the other bond that's remaining, we have one more year left on that. We'll be making the final payment in the following fiscal year, 23-24. Special revenue, uh, again, as to um, refresh from a prior presentation, represents any funds that we receive from another state or federal government entity, governmental entity. So from the federal government, we anticipate receiving uh, funds for IDEA as well as ESSA. Uh, ESSA is formerly known or maybe more popularly known as Title I, Title II, the NCLB funds. Also from the state, we receive some funds that are dedicated for some of the non-public schools that are within our uh, township. We are a pass-through for those funds, so the state provides those funds to us, and then we work with the non-public schools within our township to um, provide those funds to them. Uh, the schools that primarily get that would be Young World Day School, Apple Montessori also gets some funds as well. Total anticipate for next year is just under $700,000. Out of district costs, uh, as I said earlier, we have 62 special ed students who are out of district and 44 regular ed students that are out of district. Those regular ed students are high school level students attending Bergen County Technical and Vocational Schools or Bergen County Academies. Budget for next year in the 22-23 for, for that tuition is $6,252,000. Another large piece of the budget is employee benefits. Employee benefits representing 14.2% of the total operating budget, or right around $10,500,000. Employee benefits covers several different areas. It covers prescription benefits, health benefits, uh, any contractual benefits, such as tuition reimbursement, uh, or any payment for accumulated sick time that may be eligible to employ when they retire or leave the district. For staffing for next year, we have a total staffing to support salaries for our staff of uh, $38,797,000. This is the largest single portion of our budget. Uh, we have 499 staff that are going to be supported next year in the 22-23 budget. Uh, the staff are spread across three collective bargaining associations, the Mawa Educators Association, Administrators Association, Supervisors Association, as well as independent contracts and paraprofessionals. In total, after looking at uh, some enrollment changes in the district, uh, as well as some pro programmatic changes, we're having a net increase of 1.2 FTE for the 22-23 year in staff. Transportation was an area that we also highlighted in the last pre budget presentation. Uh, for transportation, we have a budget of $4,758,000, about 6% of the total budget. Uh, this is for transportation for students going both to and from our six schools within the township, as well as students uh, providing some of the out-of-district places that I spoke about earlier. It also includes uh, transportation costs for any field trips or for athletic uh, events that are needed throughout the year as well. Uh, transportation MAWA is split amongst contracted services as well as our own transportation staff. We have four drivers and one uh, driver who is designated as an athletic and substitute driver. Uh, we operate a fleet of 10 buses here in Mawa, and the budget does include the replacement of one of our buses for next year. Uh, buses in the state of New Jersey have a, um, are required to be replaced after a maximum of 14 years in service. And one of the last items I want to speak about is strategic planning in the budget. As we had said, this is... Um, uh, strategic planning we have looked at throughout the entire course of the year and tried to infuse it and incorporate it wherever possible. We um, took special care during the building of the 22-23 budget to make sure that the items, the program changes that we were looking at and including tied into that strategic plan. Uh, our last board, uh, board meeting when I discussed the budget, I went into a little more detail uh, regarding the uh, four areas of our strategic plan and how the budget funded each one of those areas. And with that, that concludes the presentation for the 22-23 budget. I uh, just want to take a moment to thank everybody that played a part in developing the budget for next year. Of course, the Finance and Facility Committee of the Board, uh, Central Office Administration, and Child Study Team, our principal supervisors, other support staff, and of course, the Business Office for um, helping with all the support documentation and preparing any submissions that remain to the county.
Thank you very much. Any questions from the board uh, for the 22-23 budget? Can you just explain to the public for a moment what the next steps are? So if we adopt tonight, then what happens? Sure, of course. Um, one thing I did want to mention, um, I forgot to, uh, I mentioned at our last meeting, we did, uh, after we first approved the preliminary budget in March, that was submitted to the county offices. It came back with no corrections needed from the county office as far as the uh, financial end of the budget. Uh, a few tweaks, tweaks to some narratives that we had submitted, but for the financial end, no changes were required from them. Um, after the board's um, uh, action tonight regarding the 22-23 budget. I have a couple of next steps to do within the budget software itself to submit it to the county and mark it as final. Uh, within 48 hours, I'm re the district is required to post on our website a user-friendly version of the 22-23 budget, which is required to be housed uh, throughout the school year. Uh, we have a special section on the business office page of our website where we house the, that user-friendly budget for not only the 22 and 22, 23 year, as well as prior years as well. And the last part of that, Mr. Gallo, is within the next couple weeks within our budget software that we use here in MAWA, we will um, initiate and, uh, for lack of a better word, turn on the budget for next year to allow to start any um, purchase orders and things like that that would um, be tied to or attributable to these funds can begin to be printed and sent to um, any vendors that need to go to. You're welcome. Thank you. Okay, uh, that was the first presentation I have for tonight. Uh, I do have one more, and that is a update to the Board of Education regarding the replacement of the grandstand at Mawa High School Stadium, as well as the uh, renovation to the running track. This was a project that was put into um, the 21-22 budget as a project to be funded, both projects, to be funded through a reserve from capital withdrawal uh, from our capital reserve account. We wanted to make a special effort to present this to the board tonight, as well as any members of the public that might be here. Uh, this, these plans that you're going to see are going to be uh, submitted to the uh, planning board for the Township of Mama. They have a meeting on Monday night, May 9th, where they'll be hearing this. Our engineering firm, Land Associates, will be making a presentation to them. Uh, as a courtesy to make the planning board aware of this project as well. For board members, you have uh, the full plans that are going to be shared to the planning board in front of you. Uh, I'm not going to go through every page of the plan. There's about 15 or 16 doc, uh, pages there. I did choose to highlight a couple to um, spotlight some areas of the replacement that are um, most warning, highlight, and, and recognition here. Some of the other details, such as underground uh, drainage pipes and the construction of that, I left out. Mm -hmm. That's the good stuff. Okay. And with that, I'm just going to take my laptop here. I'm going to put down the microphone. I'll speak a little bit louder for everybody to hear me. Helps me uh, control everything a little bit. So we have our um, main cover page showing the track and the uh, grandstand. This page here, zoom it in a little bit. This is a representation of our current grandstand right now. You'll see underneath these little circles everywhere represent a pier or a post that the grandstand sits on. There's about 125 posts that currently the grandstand sits on. Uh, this also is a representation of the existing pathways and paved areas that um, provide access to the front of the grandstand. Um, I do want to point out this checkered area right here and over here. Uh, while we were doing research and uh, evaluating the area, it was identified that there are some uh, previously used abandoned uh, underground tanks that were once used for the septic system here on the campus uh, prior to uh, sanitary sewer lines being in place. Those are still located underground there. We will have to do some work to properly fill those and encapsulate them. They do not need to be fully removed, but we do need to take some action to fill those uh, before the new grandstand, any piers or posts are uh, put in place for the new stand. Okay, on to the next one. This is, so what is being done is at the planning board meeting on Monday, on Monday evening, we're presenting both, and we've submitted to the state, plans for both the track renovation as well as the replacement of the grandstand. While we're, this is 
Um, encompassed under one project here, we are going to be bidding it out as two separate projects. Uh, I'll speak for a moment about the track uh, renovation right now. This is not a full milling and repaving of the full track, for those that may not be familiar. Uh, underneath the rubber surface that the track currently has, there is uh, pavement and macadam underneath that. That pavement and macadam, there are a few areas uh, where cracks have been identified that we will have to refill, but it does not require a full replacement and removal of that asphalt underneath that this time. Uh, that's something that probably within another 10 to 15 years we will have to look at. But for right now, this is just going to be a renovation where we're going to be removing the top surface and then applying a new surface on top of that. Um, in particular, I wanted to point out that the, these areas on either end of the field, which are um, uh, called the D zones, there is some drainage within these areas, particularly along the radius between the track and the field area here. These drains on both sides have deteriorated to the point where we do need to replace them, so that will be part of this project. Uh, the same drains are run along the length on the top and the bottom of the field. Those are still in good, um, good condition. We do not need to replace those at this time. The other area I wanted to point out on this page is this area right here. Currently this area is not um, part of the track. It's just a grass area. But we are looking at including that as a possible alternate to help with the um, high jump events that are held right here for student, student athletes who are coming in and uh, making the transition to the high jump. So this is one area that we may add on to uh, when we bid out the project. Okay. Um, before I move much further, that last page is most of what uh, we have about the track. Are there any questions specific about the track uh, renovation? before I move on to the grandstand where there's uh, more to discuss there. Okay. With the grandstand, this is a proposed uh, layout and plan of the new grandstand. Um, as I pointed out on the previous page, there was over 100 posts and piers beneath the current grandstand that uh, help support it. Uh, with newer technology, newer ways of building now, as opposed to when the grandstand was built, which we, we went back and found that it was at least built in the late 1960s. Um, we don't need 125 posts to support it anymore. We only have about 25 to 30 that would help support the grandstand, uh, the, the new grandstand. So it would be a lot more space underneath. What that space is going to allow us to do, what the financing facility wanted to include, was some storage units underneath. So we have three storage units for uh, some of the various items that are used for our athletic events, for track, for soccer. Um, currently, right now, we have some uh, shipping containers and storage units that it is being housed in. We want to have those removed as part of this process and have those items that are currently in those um, containers located underneath the bleachers uh, a little bit more out of the way. Uh, this does provide access doors on all sides. We have one deeper. Um, unit right here for any storage of any longer items and over here there's going to be an area where our uh, medical cart that right now we use for any athletic events can be parked inside here with proper hookups uh, for charging it. Uh, one other item to point out about the grandstand, uh, it's a big difference from what we have right now, is there's going to be about an 8 to 10 feet um, um, space between where the fence line of the last track lane is and the grandstand starts. So right now our grandstand is right up against that last lane of the track. This will provide about an eight to 10 feet worth of space um, between that fence line for the last lane of the track and where the grandstand begins. Um, there's two ways for anybody who might be um, um, access who needs special accessibility under the grandstands. We have a ramp that's gonna be located on the outside over here, and also from underneath the grandstand right here is another ramp that extends to the top, uh, or to the first landing floor of the grandstand. Stair access is over here and over here as well. So four different ways to um, enter and go onto the grandstands. Okay. Um, getting a little bit more detail, I want to highlight this number right here. 
So a little bit more detail on what the capacity of the grandstand is. We're going to have a capacity of bench seats of 1,341. There's going to be 12 spaces dedicated for wheelchair access, a total seat count of 1,353. How that compares to what we have currently, they're uh, very much the same. We have approximately 1,300 right now. So we're going to be gaining about 50 spots as well as those dedicated areas for wheelchair access. Uh, with the new grandstand. Here's a view of the side. So again, this is a um, side view of how those storage units underneath would look under the grandstand and show some of the elevation. Uh, there is, I forgot to count before we have, but we have approximately 20 to 25 rows of seats um, that we are um, planning for. There will be, going up the middle, there will be a railing up the middle as well to help uh, with access up to the top flight of the stairs as well as to the press box, which is on the, oh, starts to show on this side. So here's another side view, but what I like about this side view, it does give you a side view of the press box. Uh, chain link fence around the top where roof where um, videographers may sit as well as chain link fence around here um, to protect anybody for, for safety purposes from any falls. It's a four foot high chain, uh, chain link fence. And what this is, this press box right now, it's more elevated than what the current one is. Its placement also is uh, above that top row where right now the press box is uh, aligned with the top row in on either the left and the right. It's not sitting above it. Okay. There we go. Okay. Um, and this is the last page that I have, but this gives us a good detail of the inside of the press box, which is why I wanted to include it. So the press box and the press box is a, a modular press box, so the entire thing is going to be built off site. It's going to be trucked here, and then we're going to have a crane pick it up and then put it in place on top of the uh, steel when it is um, put in place. Here's a layout of the roof. We have one um, access hatch here to get on top of the roof, and again, there's going to be um, chain link around for safety purposes. As far as the inside of the press box, there's going to be one area for the visiting team's coaching staff, home team's coaching staff, or vice versa. And then the officiating for football games would be in the middle. Um, during events, other sporting events other than football, uh, we don't see, we may not be using one of those uh, offices. But again, for the football, we wanted to uh, have this. And this is a, a common in any new grandstands or press boxes that are being uh, built at this time. Here's a view of the front. Uh, again, across the back and across the top, chain link fence. We have windows that will operate out for, um, um, that will be, can be opened as well. Um, heat is included within the press box. We have uh, unit ventilators that would provide, or, or well, it's not, split units, thank you. Um, split units that would provide uh, heating and air conditioning uh, inside the press box as well. And the last one before I talk about the next uh, sequence of events is, again, a side view of the press box here. Some more detail as far as the materials that go into it. Uh, we also would keep any networking equipment that we need in here for uh, things such as the scoreboard, um, the lights, um, camera systems would also be housed, speaker systems would also be housed within the press box as well. Uh, as far as the next couple stages for this project, as I had said earlier, on Monday evening, it's going to be presented to the planning board. Uh, shortly afterwards, later on in the month of May, we hope to have the uh, project out to bid with a potential award, um, possibly at our June 15th meeting, but more likely at our July 15th meeting. The uh, projected time frame of doing work is going to be work to be done after this upcoming fall sports season. So after the 22 fall football soccer season is completed, we begin demo and do some of the steel work over the winter months. 
with the press box and sort of the finishing touches being put in place uh, at the end of winter, beginning of spring. Uh, following this grandstand project is when the track would be done. So the track project, which again is gonna be a separate project, that would be done after the spring 23 sports season. That is very much dependent on weather for the, um, the rubber surface that's applied. The uh, temperature has to be a minimum of 60 degrees and rising when that applies. So it's very much uh, contingent on the weather of when that, that part of the project would be done. Um, these plans, while they are going to the planning board right now, they can still have some tweaks and modifications made if there's any that do come up. But for the most part, these are gonna be the final plans that are um, uh, gonna be going out to bid on, barring anything unforeseen. Any questions regarding projects? From a timing standpoint, Kyle, you're, so the summer of 23 is basically when you're looking to do the track. Yeah, saying. yeah, following the spring so, 23 season. So it won't impact any high school athletic season? Should not, no. Cross will be able to use the field next spring, yep. and football will be able to use the football. Yes. Congratulations. Yeah. Mr. Darrell, you can keep the, the fun hey, bank off, because okay. part of my report is fine. Okay, sorry everybody, just a few more. I know you have, I've talked uh, more tonight than I usually do. But I uh, just want to highlight a couple meetings on the agenda. Um, item 17L, just to thank you again to um, the Bacchus Estate for making another contribution uh, to the um, district. Uh, this is a uh, contribution that has been on the board agenda a couple of times. This is the last allocation. There were some funds that were held in reserve for any final tax payments that the state had to pay. Uh, those have been paid. This is the last installment that we will, we will be receiving from the back to state. Again, um, thank you very much to the state for their generous donation uh, to the district. Uh, along with this is the resolution right before it, 17K. Uh, as interest rates are starting to rise, we are going to take some of the funds that we have, put it into a CD so they can mature and gain interest, um, maximize the interest that they can earn for next year. And lastly, um, item 17, BB and CC. Just want to uh, thank the coordination of the township for the lease of land. Mm -hmm. There are um, two pieces of land for those that do not know that the Board of Ed owns and leases back to the township for the purpose of um, providing recreational fields and activities to the mm -hmm. community. Uh, again, look forward to continuing that partner, um, partnership with the township for another five years. That's my report. Thank you, Bob. Yeah, Kyle, could you please um, remind the public about the generous donation from the Bacchus family, how much money they have already given to us. I mean, approximate, doesn't it? Yeah, it was it was an an extremely donor uh, extremely generous donation, um, Mr. Cohen, and, and I'll leave that. We have not disclosed the, the full sum. Um, the Bacchus estate, um, when the when it was from a a really relatively unknown family within the community. Uh, when I first received the phone call, that there was a um, um, an allocation from the estate that was due to us. Um, I never expected it to be the amount that it was. Again, I'll, I'll leave it at a very generous amount. We haven't disclosed the full amount. Um, but uh, again, very generous uh, amount from a really an unknown source. Uh, we're happy to learn a little bit about the family uh, through this process. And again, can't be uh, thankful enough for them for this donation. Okay, Dr. Fair. Good evening. So the first piece is you'll see we have uh, a retiree to honor, um, Miss Powers, um, who has such an important job in the district as a preschool teacher. Um, she interfaces with our youngest of students. So when I asked Mr. Weika, the building principal of Lundipi Meadows, and Mrs. Eason, our assistant principal, uh, some adjectives that we could use to describe Marge, um, they shared that she can be characterized as accomplished, inventive, and thoughtful. Uh, we honor and thank Marge for her 18 years of dedication and service to the Mawa Township Schools and her creativity and ability to make things come to life in the preschool program. Uh, and we hope that she knows that this is how she's going to be remembered. 
for her devotion and hard work as a preschool teacher and introducing children to their first formative years of school. We wish Mrs. Powers a well-deserved and relaxing retirement. Uh, we hope that she enjoys this new journey of her life and uh, we congratulate her. Uh, you'll see on this evening's agenda, uh, we also have 14 new hires, uh, as well as um, three asterisks for uh, agenda items 18Q, 18R, and 18S. You have those resumes sitting before you. Uh, I just want to uh, sincerely thank the board for um, your support and your flexibility. Um, we've just hired these three uh, new staff members or we're going to be recommending them to you for approval um, this past Monday. So that's why they, they didn't make it to the agenda um, last week. Uh, the next piece, uh, I wanna highlight Mawa High School. They just recently had a college and career fair. Um, and it, not only was it a successful event for our students, uh, but we were able to showcase a wide continuum uh, of options for our kids uh, from, for all different types of students. So um, we included Berkeley College, Lincoln Tech, uh, the Terry O'Connor Real Estate School, and Bergen County Law and Public Safety, um, which were, were nice additions. Uh, and, and the last piece, uh, Dr. Otoro and I have been talking to Mawa High School about, um, and we've, we've shared this with the board, about, you know, really branding and showcasing your work. Um, what they did here, um, and, and Kyle has it emanated from his laptop on the screen here. Um, we've been talking about the Career Pathways Program and dual enrollment, uh, and what uh, Mr. Pascal and the high school team were able to do is create uh, a much easier to navigate um, system where teachers, students, and families uh, will be able to, to navigate a variety of resources. So on the left-hand side, um, Guidance has a, a wealth of resources related to anything from guidance procedures and school counseling and scheduling to pre-college enrichment experiences and resources for college and career counseling. And um, underneath Find Your Path, Mr. Bleeker, if you could just scroll down and keep scrolling, you'll see here uh, we have showcased all of our career pathways. So that's inclusive of biotechnology, research, and health science business administration, engineering and technology, government and social sciences, information and computer science technology, performing and communication arts, technical career and community, and visual and integrated design. And Mr. Bleeker, if you could just select one of them. I just want to showcase for the board and the public, um, under Find Your Path, students and families are able to peruse the Career Pathways overview, um, as well as the trajectory of coursework related to each pathway, um, along with associated co-curricular opportunities and relevant goals associated with each of those pathways, um, along with images of each pathway program in action. So if you could just uh, just scroll down briefly, this gives, um, gives our families and our students as they're navigating high school um, a real comprehensive look, a real easy to understand snapshot uh, for parents to then, and students to then, um, if they have clarifying questions, they can obviously go to uh, their school counselors. But I thought it was really worthy to note that um, the, the rebranding the re or the, the more overt branding um, is, is a reality, and we appreciate their efforts. And that's it for my, my report this evening. Thank you. Thank you, guys. President's report. Uh, Dr. Morthy did leave some uh, some stuff here for me. Um, first, the board would like to congratulate Melanie Gilbert, who's a junior, and Colin Mossman, who's a freshman, who have been accepted into the 2022-23 All-State Chorus. This is quite an accomplishment. They will be performing in Atlantic City and uh, in JPAC in Newark next November. Uh, so congratulations to Melanie and Colin. And I'd like to read a, um, a resolution that we're adding to new business tonight, if I may. Honoring Teacher Appreciation Week. Whereas the strength of Mawa Township's education is a reflection of the teachers of this district, each of whom dedicates their time and efforts toward ensuring that every student has a chance to succeed and 
Whereas, while the importance of their efforts is sometimes taken for granted, teachers are shaping the next generation of citizens and entrepreneurs who will lead this nation for years to come. And whereas, in light of these contributions, it is altogether fitting and proper for the Mawa Township Public Schools to formally honor the first full week in May as Teacher Appreciation Week, which has been annually observed as the Teacher or National Teacher Appreciation Week since 1985. Be it resolved that upon the recommendation of the Superintendent of Schools, the Mawa Board of Education honors the work of all educators in the Mawa, public, Mawa Township Public Schools and expresses its sincere appreciation for their efforts in their collective and dedicated work in supporting all students of the Mawa Township Public Schools. So that is added as 17EE under new business. We have any committee reports tonight? Mr. Just two real quick, I didn't put a whole presentation together tonight, but I uh, just want uh, from Community Corner, just want to wish everyone a very happy Mother's Day. Uh, Ms. Davanero, Ms. Sacone, Dr. Morthy, uh, Dr. Pavino, and Ms. Rizzo, happy Mother's Day, and to everyone out there, um, have a great day, and guys, just have a couple more days to find the cards for the kids, um, <laughs> so get out there and find them. Um, second report is on the transportation committee, we had our first meeting. Um, Last week, I want to thank everyone for attending. We put together, we're working on putting together our goals and objectives, and I want to thank uh, Mr. Bleeker for um, for helping us and uh, starting us on the on the path of transportation 101 and getting a better understanding uh, of what the transportation program is. Uh, with that being said, um, I do want to encourage the um, the residents. If you have any questions or um, suggestions or concerns, please feel free to reach out to me. Uh, from a transportation standpoint, we are looking for feedback. We will be putting together some kind of feedback form that we'll be sending out. But in the meantime, uh, you can find my email address and feel free to shoot me an email with any kind of questions or ideas or suggestions. So, appreciate it. Thanks. Thanks, Brad. Anyone else? Mr. Gallo. I'm just going to comment on the uh, grandstand project for a moment. This. This project, when I first heard about this project from Scott Vandermark a number of years ago, I was a little skeptical of like, you know, what's it really gonna do for us? It has become a transformational project for our high school and for our district, together with the concession stand project, which we completed two years ago. That entire area will be completely renovated and renewed. Our goals of creating ADA access, uh, addressing uh, storage uh, requirements that have been unmet for years and was uh, met through a hodgepodge of, of semi-effective methods. Um, and also setting back the grandstand from the track are all, they don't sound like much, but in total, the project is transformative of that area. We, the class of 93 alumni who are on our committee have further visions of what we can do with that space, but it is going to be, um, it is going to dramatically improve the appearance, the functionality, and safety of the area, as well, and the press box, considering where we, our press box is, box is today, um, this, is a, this is a huge leap forward um, in terms of functionality. Um, this was a project that um, Roger Pelletier, John Pascal, Greg, Kyle, our uh, engineers and architects at Land Associates spent a lot of time on it. The committee spent a lot of time on it. We gave a, a lot of comments, um, some detailed, some uh, more strategic. Um, but I look forward to this project coming to fruition. It's an expensive investment in our facilities, but it'll be uh, enduring for many, many years in service from students for years and years to come. So I'm very uh, thankful and grateful for Kyle and his team and all the folks who contributed to the ultimate design. Um, so I just wanted to mention that. Anyone else? Mr. Denise. The uh, policy committee has uh, four policies and regulations on tonight's agenda for first reading. Um, this is based on our review of the 6000 series, which we actually completed. Um, uh, basically, these are just uh, formatting and grammar punctuation changes, nothing really substantial. Stop. I wanted to cut our work. It's <laughs> important. <laughs> Anyone else? Okay, from the Executive Committee on uh, 17P, we have the second reading of uh, the five bylaws that we, uh, that we looked at uh, last time. Any 
Board member remarks, uh, non agenda items. Mr. Cobb. Yeah, on, um, on April 22nd, I had um, a, the honor of going in and presenting in front of our DECA club. I want to thank Ms. Ferguson and Ms. Torino uh, for inviting me again. We, we spoke about branding and marketing, and um, if you know about the high school clubs, they meet during lunch. So it, it was interesting and fun watching the, the kids eat lunch at 10 30 in the morning. So <laughs> that was an interesting thing. But I also want I, the reason I mentioned it tonight is just to highlight again the Thunderbird partnership. Um, if, if you're not on it, please get on it. If you have a skill, um, if, if you have knowledge of some topic, uh, please put your name on there. It is a resource that our, our staff are using. Uh, they're using it more. Um, and as we grow this list and this database and make it more robust, it's going to become a, a, a greater resource for our staff. So I'm encouraging everyone out there, uh, please put your name on there. It is extremely rewarding to go in there, uh, regardless of what school you're going to, because uh, I know all of our schools are using it. So please, it, you know, I'm looking at everyone here on the board, but I'm also asking everyone in the public to please put your name on there and, and, and get involved, because it, it definitely is a, is a wonderful program we have. Thanks. Thank you. Thank you. else? Okay, old business. May I have a motion on the minutes from the last meeting? Mr. Kuzbarski, second by Ms. Cohn. Mr. Leaker. Okay, Dr. Park. Yes. Ms. Go. Yes. Mr. Cobble. Yes. Ms. Davidero. Yes. Mr. Denise. Yes. Mr. Gallo. Yes. Mr. Kazmorski. Yes. And Mr. De Silva. Yes. Uh, new business. Uh, I would like to entertain a motion on AA through DD. A through Yeah, I'm sorry. A through DD. <laughs> Mr. Gallo, second by Mr. Kazmorski. Any comments? I'd like to throw out there, thank you to Kyle for uh, the, the budget, you know, being involved in that process is, you know, almost uh, close to $80 million. It's, it's, a, it's a big job, it's a lot of work, and, uh, you know, it's a lot of coordination, so great job. And thank, thank you. you. And please pull the roll. 417A through DD, Dr. Park. Yes. Ms. Sico. Yes. Mr. Coblin. Yes. Ms. Devanero. Yes. Mr. Denise. Yes. Mr. Gallup. Yes. Mr. Kazmarski. Yes, but I will abstain from 17BB and 17CC. I would, however, like to thank the board for the conclusion of the lease to the township for the use of the fields. And Mr. De Silva. Yes. And if I can have a motion on 17EE, which is the resolution uh, that I read earlier. Mrs. Cohen. Second by Mr. Coughlin. For Resolution 17 EE, Dr. Bark. Yes. Ms. Sacone. Yes. Mr. Coughlin. Yes. Ms. Davanero. Yes. Mr. Denise. Yes. Mr. Gallo. Yes, and thank you to all our teachers. Mr. Kazmarski. Yes. And Mr. De Silva. Yes. And new business, I'd like to take uh, entertain a motion on A through N N. Yes. Mr. Denise, second by Dr. Park. Eighteen A through N N, Doctor Park. Yes. Ms. Go. Yes. Mr. Coplin. Yes. Ms. Davanero. Yes. Mr. Denise. Yes. Mr. Gallo. Yes. Mr. Kazmarski. Yes. And Mr. De Silva. Yes. Public questions or comment. Public participation in board meetings is in accordance with bylaw zero one six seven. At this time, members of the public may ask questions or make a comment on educational issues or school matters of community interest. As a matter of fairness, you're asked to limit your questions to no more than one and your remarks to no longer than three minutes. If you're here representing a group, please identify yourself, the group, and your position in the group. If you're here as an individual, please give us your name and address. This section of public participation will be limited to 15 minutes. May I have a motion to open to the public? Mr. Copeland, second by Mr. Kuzmarski, and we're open at 8.08. Good evening. John Fiedton, 20 Falcon Court, Mawa, New Jersey. Two small things. One, thank you, Kyle, for the presentation on the new track and the grandstand. 
I'm not familiar with that area, but while you're doing this, it's a good opportunity to make sure that that grandstand, uh, the access to it by emergency vehicles, uh, very, very important. Uh, you know, with 1,500 people or so in the grandstand, you want to get an ambulance in there and out very quickly, very nicely. It could be great right now, I have no idea. But while you're doing it, you might as well include a emergency vehicle access so it's real simple in and out. There's John was recently promoted to driver for Mama. <laughs> I'm, I'm in training to be a, He's a ambulance driver for Mawa, and I don't want Thank ever to see you guys really? in the back of my <laughs> ambulance. I'm not going to drive you to Valley. <laughs> 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 uh, the second thing is, uh, yes, I saw that Facebook post about that young lady from Mawa High School winning that National Merit Scholarship. Fantastic. That is to be recognized and celebrated really, really good. Um, but, you know, I looked at Facebook and there are other scholarships, not to the same extent, but I believe the uh, Republican Club is offering $500 and the Pride group is $500 also. Is My assumption is that somebody at the high school senior level is pulling all that together and yes. telling everybody about that and we're not missing any opportunity. Yes. The Republican Club scholarship is near and dear to my heart because I gave five hundred dollars. That's my <laughs> no, no, that's my money, <laughs> and I did it. And I, I I'm not here to be boastful about it, but I did it because Rick De Silva, he has made a lot. He and his family have made a lot of contributions to Mala, and when I was at the uh, Mala Museum. He was the one who provided a uh, very nice check for a, a new historical marker right in front of the station. So I was always very impressed by that. I know he's, he and his family have done a lot of things for Mawa, and I don't own a car dealership, so in my own way, <laughs> <laughs> I can contribute, make, I can make some contribution at my level. <laughs> Um, so I'm glad that people are doing this and pulling things together. Mm -hmm. Thank you for your time. Thank My you. daughter is a two-time runner-up winner of the Republican essay contest. She got 500 bucks in the, in between the, she got your $500. Well, some, <laughs> I, I hope it, it, it's open to any high school yep. senior who lives in Mawa. And that would be good if it was a Mawa high school student. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Daniel Ryan, 22 Riverview Terrace, Mala. Um, I've talked about this before. I got the email about now the testing being offered to students, COVID testing to students. Um, wondering if there's, like how this came about in terms, are we getting funding from somewhere for offering this service or is it just something that we're doing? And just where that came from, because I'm not in the schools. Um, I didn't know students weren't, weren't allowed access till now. So. Yeah, so um, it's federally funded, so it's, it's no out of pocket for the district. We've had it available for staff. Um, we started to provide it as a service for those who remained unvaccinated, and the, uh, the state mandate to have unvaccinated staff members tested weekly. Um, so we've offered that to our staff members. And through the remainder of the school year, we thought it would be um, ideal to just offer it to students who may be presenting with symptoms and their parents aren't, you know, able to get to a doctor, they don't want to wait in line, we have the service here for them. Okay. Um, as I've brought up, again, like this just seems like a, such a huge conflict of interest that we're providing testing for students while simultaneously offering uh, cash to the nurses for every positive case. 
that, that's not happening any longer. The, the nurses aren't involved in the testing as an outside agency. So there's, there's no conflict. Um, we uh, discontinued um, our contact tracing. Uh, that's what you're referring to along lines of the compensation. Uh, so that's no longer in place. Okay, because just to be clear, um, I've asked previously, it was stated that even if a case didn't um, require contact tracing, that they were still getting that bonus. So that's no longer. Now, now the, what, what took place along the lines of the, the, even if the, the case didn't take a need contact tracing. So there was a protocol that was in place when contact tracing occurred. When we were talking about even if they didn't need to uh, identify, um, if no close contacts were identified, that's a whole different situation. But they still have to go through the protocol when contact tracing was happening mm -hmm. to make sure that they're interviewing the case, ident really going back the certain amount of days that they needed to to identify what were the inter interaction with the different parties, work with the staff and the administration to make sure that it was a comprehensive in nature. Identifying close contacts, there were cases that there were no close contacts identified. That's different. Right now, we don't have close contact, uh, we don't have contact tracing happening. We discontinued that a couple weeks back. Yes, I know. So the word, so because the way that um, I don't know what it's called, a resolution was worded, was that this would continue through the end of the year. So you're Correct. saying because I didn't see anywhere that this uh, that that resolution had since ceased. So it no longer exists since contact tracing ended. That stopped. Yeah. So upon the the discontinuation of contact tracing, that compensation structure no longer exists. Okay. And in terms of the on-site testing. Our in-house nurses have nothing to do with it. So we had there's an outside vendor who has nurses, and those nurses come here on, on Tuesdays and Fridays mm -hmm. to gather the the so specimens. So previously, though, let's say a teacher got tested and it was positive, because I thought I asked this question and that it was responded that even without contact tracing, you would still be entitled to that money. So what you're saying is, if a teacher tested positive. Um, Require did not uh, did not require contact tracing, or even if they did, wouldn't the nurse was receiving money even though an outside agency was conducting the testing, or did no. they our I, nurses do I, the I school think, testing? I think where the confusion is, the two you're mer you're merging the two. So what's taking place is there's the contact tracing takes takes place when there's a positive case. That's in and of itself, mm -hmm. right? That was discontinued a couple weeks ago. Then there's testing. The testing is there's positive and negatives. A positive triggers, in the past, the need for contact tracing. Mm -hmm. That no longer occurs. If you are positive, then you are removed um, if you're not vaccinated for X period of time. But that those two didn't, are, are not going together currently. Am I answering your question? I, or am I, I, I confused, confused on the question? I'm sorry. The way it was worded to me, I was under the impression, and I think I asked and was told that no matter what, contact tracing or not, it was just positive case, period. Yes. Yeah, so in, in the past, when we had that compensation structure in place, mm -hmm. yes, a positive case triggered the, the, the compensation that you're referring to because it still required the school nurse to in interface with the staff member or the student to determine if there were close contacts or not. So it still was time spent to figure out if there were close contacts and to go through that process. So that before contact tracing was discontinued, that was part of the compensation structure. Now that contact tracing has been discontinued, that's no longer part of it. Okay. Okay. Um, and then secondly, <clears throat> um, this is uh, unrelated, and it's not a question; it's a statement. Um, it's about the new standards that are coming into effect in the fall, um, and. I started, after our last uh, meeting, I really started uh, looking into it and reading exactly what um, the laws were, because I understand you can opt out um, of health classes, um, and that's when, and I, I only looked at, uh, so far, second grade, it's a ton of reading material, my kids are young, so that's where uh, my concerns mostly lie, um, but I'm curious how, um, so you can opt out of health, and you can't be punished for doing so. Um, on our on the New Jersey site, when you look up the new standards, um, it does say that all those topics that parents are upset about and want to possibly opt their children out, um, they're they're portraying to us this false sense of um, having that option that you can just opt out your children. Um, but then when you're reading it, it says that district boards of education shall be responsible 
for the review and continuous improvement of curriculum and instruction based upon changes in knowledge, technology, assessment results, and modifications. Um, and then it, it continues to go on saying that um, these, uh, these 21st century um, topics, they actually say 22nd century, I don't know who wrote that, um, that it's to be sprinkled throughout every uh, lesson. So <coughs> even if you want to opt out, you can't because it's sprinkled in all subject matter. It's not just um, in, uh, it's not just in the health classroom, it's gonna be everywhere. Uh, so, and earlier they brought up, um, I, I forget the man's name, uh, but he brought up um, that a video was shown and at the end of the video, I don't, I'm not familiar with the video, but um, BLM is mentioned in this video. Um, as somebody with more, and, and everything's written very liberally in this, uh, in this, um, assessment. I'll, I'll, I have a few red flags for me for a second grader, um, but as bringing in political views into the classroom just seems very, uh, and I guess you can't keep politics out of everything, but to be bringing in what seems to be a very one-sided um, view is where my problem is. So under the um, social and sexual health core idea performance expectations for second grade, um, one of the star, one of my red flags, discuss the range of way people express their gender and how gender role stereotypes may limit behavior. Growing up, I'm one generation removed from current, you know, kids. Um, growing up, it was called gender norms. It was called gender roles. Now it's gender stereotypes, and we're and we're teaching this to our second graders that now it's a stereotype, not a not a norm. Um, under community health services and support, which Somehow we're including, describe how climate change affects the health of individuals, plants, and animals. I don't know how that's connected to um, the other points that they want to teach. Determine where to access home, school, and community health professions. Demonstrate how to dial 911. Like, all that sounds great. That makes sense. Um, but we're bringing climate change into it. Again, it's a, it's a, it is a political issue, climate change. That's the way it's portrayed. I, really, I think we could agree that... Um, uh, that people see climate change as a as a non as a uh, two sides having like differing opinions, um, but sprinkling it into community health services, I don't see the the connection. Um, then we're in career readiness, and this is where Marxism's brought in to change it up. Um, they want to teach a second grader that there are um, they, the good things, different types of jobs require different knowledge and skills, but then the red flag. There are benefits and drawbacks to being an entrepreneur, um, as we want to just be having little worker bees and not, not having people do their own uh, thing. And every profession has drawbacks, so I don't know why we would attack entrepreneurs um, in our great country where it's built on entrepreneurs. And finally, the, uh, the final red flag, uh, for lack of a better term, uh, in the di digital citizenship, um, Again, we're bringing up climate change under digital citizenship. Young people can have a positive impact on the natural world in the fight against climate change. That, that has nothing to do with a digital citizenship, um, where the other things are individuals should practice safe behaviors when using the internet. Um, digital communication allows for social interactions that can be both positive and negative. So those things um, go back to the, the title of digital citizenship, but just throwing in that's not even, it's just a statement that young people can help against climate change. Um, so these are all, it's not a question, it's just really looking at exactly what these, um, these topics that they're discussing, uh, they're, they're making, I, these are all very liberal views um, and nothing, uh, it seems like, it, we're not getting both sides of things, it's just going to be, how our governor is choosing um, to push his liberal agenda, and you really don't have an opt out because it's sprinkled everywhere. Thanks. Anyone else? So, back to my main question regarding the curriculum. The big question is, uh, I understand from this nice gentleman, John, he met with, um, I think you're speaking now. <laughs> the curriculum is supposed to be 
finalized by August. Is that is that what we're looking at? Yes, they'll be working so, on it over the summer. Yeah. So my big question is for a lot of us that are kind of figuring out what we should do with our children. Um, that that's really not enough time because it's there's some of us that are really trying to figure this out. Um, the big question is, um, being as you all are setting policies, is the standards, I looked at the social studies curriculum myself, and um, for example, my child would be going into eighth grade next year, so if you look at the eighth grade um, civics part of the curriculum for next year, under the eighth grade social studies, they're learning all about um, in other words, if you look at the Civil War under the eighth grade curriculum, they're learning about um, not what they were, I, I've compared it to what they've been learning all along, and they're looking at the United Nations. I'm not, I looked at the whole thing, it's all United Nations, United Nations, United, everything is, and then that leads you to the United Nations 2030 agenda. It's not, it's just not, it, it, like um, Danielle just said, it's all one-sided. It's not the social studies that I would want. So my question to you is, is it set in stone, it's August? Because I, I need to figure this out. I mean, it's- It takes a lot of time for-, for I understand that, so but it also, as a parent, so, I need to so figure they, it out. Right, so they, so they put a, a, a deadline of August on there so that you know, the work gets done over the, over the summer. That's not to say that nothing's gonna happen until the last minute, and then all of a sudden they're going to do everything in August. They're going to be working all summer long. So once that's available, I would encourage you to, to, to review it and make your decision at that time. So if we're telling you as parents, August is not, it's just not okay. I mean, you as a board, is there any part of your board that says, we get the parents, this is really not enough time. There are parents that this is not, I mean, it's one well, the, side. The alternative is really to, to rush through the curriculum, which is really not appropriate either. So is there so any we, part got, of you as a board that says teachers. we can override we, the governor's orders? No, we can no. say we need oh, more no, time. No, that's, it's state law. It's not state law. You as a board entity can override the governor suppose, as a board entity. I, I suppose you know that. If, we, if we were to tell our staff that we want it done before August, I No, guess, what I'm I saying is you can, can override and hold off and no. keep your standards in place. No. That, so you're not even questioning to do that. That it's, the, the standards are state law. We don't have a choice but to, but to comply with the standards. That's but what I'm saying option. is you know you can override that and wait a while and, no, and choose to. No, that's not the way it works. That isn't the way it works. You Are you get, sure you about that? You don't get to choose which, what, you know, what, what laws you, you comply with. So as a board, you're telling me you cannot state override law the governor? State law and the, this, 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 and there, this body cannot over, override state law. That's correct. Are, I, that's not correct. Absolutely I'm not correct. pretty sure we're, we don't have the authority to override state law. You can no, override really governor's can. orders. Yes, you can. Yes, you absolutely can. You can say, we're going to enact them following. That's, we that's need more time to write orders and stick with what you have. Ms. Bellar, that's not how it works. Let me just share with you. There's standards that are set forth, and they, the standards are shared for uh, public and, and for schools to, to review. There's a review time for those standards, and then there, there's a timeline that we have to enact those standards. We are going to be writing those standards over the summer. I know that Dr. Rubino sent the out curriculum. Uh, curriculum. the curriculum over the summer that are aligned to those standards. Um, Dr. Rubino sent out a, a, a letter, I believe, last week, explaining how we understand that there's a lot of questions and a lot of feelings specific to these standards and what would be embedded in our new curriculum. With that being said, um, there is, to speak to a previous question, there is an online access that you can get on to see all curriculum that we have in place. So that answers so can, the question then. So I'm gonna, if, if I'm you're going to write what he, what he wants you to write in there, then there's really no decision for us. Well, I'm going to continue. So I'm sorry, um, no. along the lines of the curriculum access, I just want to make sure that all parents know they, they have that access. The second piece is informing the parents of the changes that are taking place. And within the letter, it talks about not only will we share that information, um, every single grade um, that is going to be taking part in this health curriculum. There'll be a letter that's going to be sent out um, to the parents, whether it's a digital letter that's housed on a parent portal or a letter that's going to be emailed to the parents that are going to identify the teaching points that are going to be covered within those units. There's also going to be an opportunity for parents to reach out to the schools to get even further detail um, within 
um, that curriculum. So you will be eyes wide open prior to your student going into the lessons, uh, and you do have an option um, of opting out of that, of that experience. So just so you know, we, we are aware that there's a lot of conversation out there, and, and as parents, there, there's concern about what's to come, because there's a lot of gray area. There's a lot of conversations, and then there's a lot of, well, what does it really look like in practice? There were, there were resources that were pulled to say, well, is this the curriculum? And that caused concern. There's no set curriculum for these standards. The school district is obligated to create a curriculum that identifies these specific standards and performance expectations. That's going to be shared with all of our community prior to implementation. Okay, so one final question. What is there to share when it's written right there in the governor's order this, the social studies standards okay, as, are as completely Dr. changed. As Dr. Dutero just said, the standards, we have to come up with the curriculum so that at the end of the grade level, the students meet those standards. If the Department of Education got anything right, it's pretty vague, which allows us a lot of latitude to take into consideration what we're hearing from the community. We, we still have to comport with state law. So can you add back in the stuff that they, they took out? Is, is that a, a, an option? Like, for example, the stuff that, like on the Civil War and the stuff that they omitted, can the stuff that's important to some of the parents that we've always taught, could that, are they, or is that, you know, important to, like, have we had those discussions? So we align our curriculum to the standards set forth. Okay. Right? I just want to add on to what Dr. Latour was saying, because he had mentioned the conversation that's taking place. Okay. There are two different documents. The first document that was released by the Department of Ed had a whole litany of topics that should be addressed. And if you scrolled social media or you know you checked our email, everyone had different types of concerns because they believed, based on reading that document, and understandably so, that those listed topics had to be taught exactly the way that they were listed. Then the Department of Ed followed with a second document that referred to that huge litany that everyone keeps referring to as mere examples. So right now we're working through what, are, what examples are we going to use, and we trust in our teachers, and of course Dr. Bovino is going to be overseeing this process to be thoughtful enough to select the topics that work best for our district. No, no, I, just, I went through the actual standards. I didn't use the examples. I okay, went through right. the mandated well, a, staff. A lot of people are, are, are yeah, attaching no, ju that. just to those yeah, examples. Yeah, I got that. Yeah, no, I just went through the standards and I just, I looked at the social studies because that was important to our family and then I looked at what was taken out. So I guess that was my question. Is, is any of that maybe, or is Dr. Gavino more the one that asked with that, if they were going to add any of that back in? Because that's kind of important. Is that something that's... The the, the first person you would go to is really the content supervisor. They'll be able okay. to under, give, really right. give you an understanding of the department as a whole, especially really grade-specific questions when you're referring to eighth grade, whatever Eighth grade it social studies. I just thought, because it it's kind of sad yeah. that we changed social studies. You know, so know. so okay. the, the social studies supervisor will be able to address any question and provide clarity that you have. All right. Well, thank you. Yeah. Thanks for your time. Can I drop off? Thank you. What else? Hi, I'm Leah Matzel. I'm at Two Merrill Drive in Marwa. Thanks very much to everything you presented tonight. Really amazing. Um, I just wanted to mention my thoughts and my research about the optional and voluntary on-site COVID-19 testing. Um, first of all, I want to say to the board and supers, I think you guys have been the least draconian of any school district that I've heard of as far as um, really coming down on the students and the families with all the different things that have come down from the state. Very, very happy and grateful that you've done absolutely the best to kind of minimize and make things as comfortable as possible for students and families. Um, and I definitely feel that uh, we're not your adversaries. I'm not here to criticize anything. I think of us as teammates and very proud to be involved here. Um, I think that there's been a tremendous lack of transparency, particularly coming down from the state, that brings us a lack of trust and a lot of concern when I hear something about voluntary uh, on-site testing. So 
just kind of reading this letter, I'm not sure if you wrote it or if it's kind of maybe a form letter that came from the testing place because there's some wording in here that seems odd for optional and voluntary. Firstly, it describes the testing process, approximately one minute, and it says, as participants become accustomed to this collection process. Now, I would think that this is supposed to be kind of really one-off, someone's going on vacation, someone's going to a wedding, they need a COVID test for the child. It really shouldn't be something they're becoming accustomed to. If Second, I could, if I could just interject real quick. Initially, like um, Dr. Pear said, this was for staff who chose to not be vaccinated and had to be tested every week. So that's probably what that's referring to. Okay, uh, I hear you. I, I think then that, you know, it's definitely not quite clear. There's another line in here that talks about will allow for your child's weekly test results to be collected and reviewed swiftly. Again, I don't know why the language in here, which I'm sure you looked at quite closely, would say weekly. It just somehow suggests that potentially this is sort of a rollout. So that's all I wanted to um, specifically mention about that. I want to talk a little bit about the company that we're working with because perhaps you're not aware of it. And again, it's coming from a federal level. Um, it's showing that you know you create an account. It's very easy. You can do it quickly. Uh, you do it once. And it says specific to Mawa Township Public Schools. But the township is not holding the data. This concentric by Ginkgo is holding the data. So um, also, I kind of feel like, is this a situation where perhaps a child has a runny nose and the nurse is going to encourage a child, hey, well, have mom fill this out real easy, quick, and you should go get tested? Because I personally feel that I don't think it's the best um, idea to have the nurses sort of recommending anything medical testing or otherwise to the kids. And I also don't think it's a good idea to have parents in a position where they have to refuse, and perhaps it's listed somewhere, refused COVID test. And, and that's not going to occur. So okay. the nurses aren't recommending anything. Well, we provided this service to parents, and we were really clear. I think we like highlighted certain places because it's optional and voluntary. So yes, parents, because obviously parents are very against mandatory. Like I thought it was funny that it's on the su subject line optional and voluntary because clearly that's a line in the sand for a lot of parents. Absolutely, and we do have some parents who want their child to be tested weekly, and that's totally up to them, and okay. that's why it's optional and voluntary. Okay, super. Let me just give a quick background on why I'm finding it extremely concerning about this particular company. Ginkgo Bioworks is the one that owns Concentric. They are a synthetic biology company. They specialize in using genetic engineering to produce bacteria with industrial applications, and they are an analytics company that designs microorganisms for customers in a range of industries. Their mission is to make COVID-19 the last pandemic that catches us unprepared. Not the last pandemic, the last pandemic that catches us unprepared. We dream of a future without COVID-19 variants or other biological threats. But in the event that they, uh, this happens, we can be prepared through Concentric's early warning system. So basically, when you sign up and you register, you're kind of in their database, you're part of their early warning system. Uh, what began as a response to monitor COVID-19 became a foundation for adaptive infrastructure capable of informing communities of public health changes. So what they're trying to say is that they can adapt it for testing to anything, and potentially your data is going to avail be available to the public health authorities. So I have not gone through, I'm not registering for this, so I didn't look through the consent form. But as I get further into the details of who owns this company, I'm pretty sure that the data will go around HIPAA so that someone else can get access to your data. It's not going to be just for you. Um, building confidence through biosecurity. I didn't know that we needed to worry about biosecurity, but it says to create a future where environmental and community health is within reach for everyone we study how biology behaves around us, and to find ways to catch and contain biological threats. So they're definitely in the business of, um, you know, <laughs> biological threats, producing bacteria, and designing microorganisms. They bought Concentric. Concentric is building next generation biosecurity and public health platform with the aim of providing pathogen biomonitoring at scale. The acquisition is an important step towards that. They have enough contracted and validated labs to serve tens of millions of individuals with pooled tests every week, meaning that they could take our data, 
from our school and pool it with all the other school districts. Uh, and then they stand ready to further invest and expand their biosecurity. So basically, for public health efforts. So basically, the data could potentially be utilized to, um, I don't want to say create a pandemic, but it's questionable what the data with a company that produces bacteria. I, I, it sounds like you're, you're skeptical and definitely have an issue with this company, and I think you're right to not participate. Um, well, I think parents need to just have a little more information. I just have right. one more thing I'd like to cover. This, you. The parent, there, are, there are a lot Everybody of Everybody else got to speak. I'd like to just finish what I have to say, please. Another minute, please. Okay. A publicly traded company, it is largest shareholder is hedge fund Viking Global Investors. It's also Viking's largest holding itself, the CEO. Andreas Halverson is a billionaire, level one top executive at the World Economic Forum. Number two shareholder Ginkgo of Ginkgo is General Atlantic. CEO is also part of the economic, World Economic Forum and board member of BlackRock. So it took me five minutes to get from your email to World Economic Forum and BlackRock. And their goal is recurring revenue. They are banking on your children, being mandatorily tested, we're not, they we're, cannot, not, we're not doing mandatory tests. Yeah, I, 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 I just want to be very clear, um, especially because this is you know going to be on YouTube. Okay. Nothing about on-site testing is mandatory. Yes. It is up. It is optional wow. and voluntary, and it's going to remain optional and voluntary. Thank well, you. I think that it's to get people accustomed to the Thank idea you. of doing Thank this kind of much. testing at Thank school. You. Thank you. Right. Well, other parents need to hear it too. Do you have anyone else? That's why they shut you down. No, we didn't shut anyone down. We didn't shut anyone down. Everybody else gets involved. And you, you, you had plenty of time. So anyone else? I'll have a motion to close. Mr. Kuzmarski, second by Mr. Gallup. We are closed at eight forty-one. Okay, uh, at this point, we're going to uh, recess into executive session for uh, personnel matters and confidential student matters. There will be no action taken when we, uh, when we leave the meeting, so thank you all for coming tonight. May I have a motion to go into executive? Mr. Gallo, second by Mr. Cobb. Okay. Mr. Uh, Martinez, you can the uh, streaming session at this time. Thank you. Oh, no. I think the chair is...